Hello, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of MGMI, we would like to thank Dr. Joel Phillips and Dr. Christopher Glisson for their talks yesterday at the 2020 Patient Educational Conference. My name is Amy Grover, and I am the Director of Advocacy at Catalyst Pharmaceuticals. My role at Catalyst is to ensure that the patient voice is heard and to be the champion for the community. We support efforts to advocate and raise awareness for key patient issues. This presentation is being supported by Catalyst Pharmaceuticals, and today's presenter will be compensated. Today, we are joined by Dr. Amit Sachdev. And Dr. Sachdev is Director of Neuromuscular Medicine and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Michigan State University. He cares for 150 patients with Mycenae gravis annually and has patients with every subtype of the disease. He is also a researcher, currently enrolling six clinical trials. Dr. Sachdev is a Mich Michigan native and enjoys community building, outreach, and education. He has been featured 60 times in the last several years in publications such as Women's Health, Silver Sneakers, and Self Magazine, where he has provided patient education on a number of topics in neurology. Welcome, Dr. Sachdev. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. Uh, and I really want to commend um, Catalyst for taking the initiative to focus in on Lambert Eaton patients uh, and to try to educate them on their disease. Uh, really, a group of people that uh, are not often thought of. Oh, wonderful. So, today, you and I are going to talk about the differences and similarities between Mycenae gravis and Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, which is also known as LEMS. So, let's jump in and get started. I'm All excited. Right. <laughs> Me too. So, I understand that LEMS and MG are closely related, and many times uh, LEMS patients are diagnosed first with MG. Can you explain, you know, why that might happen? Yeah, of course. Uh, so, both Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome and myasthenia gravis are diseases that interfere with the nerve's ability to talk to the muscles. And so they can look pretty similar in many circumstances. Uh, and myasthenia gravis is many times more common than Lambert Eaton, despite them both being rare. Lambert Eaton is really a rare subtype of a rare disease. So myasthenia gravis is the disease that's more commonly known. Uh, and when you have a patient who looks like they have myasthenia gravis, but they don't quite behave like your typical myasthenia patient, that's often the time when so a hunt occurs to try to figure out what might be missed. Exactly. And, and if there is a, a patient that is diagnosed with you know, MG, but they, they're just not quite sure, you know, what are your recommendations? And I know that possibly some LEMS patients go down a different path for quite some time before being, you know, brought back to a LEMS diagnosis. Yeah. So there are really good blood markers. Uh, and uh, I had a chance to speak for the Muscle Dystrophy Association a couple of weeks ago, and, and one of our speakers uh, issued a challenge. He said, know your blood marker. Um, and it's if you have one blood marker, that doesn't mean you can't have the others. But if you know your blood marker and your blood marker is the traditional acetylcholine receptor blood marker, odds are you have traditional myasthenia gravis. If you're antibody negative, we don't know which marker you have. Then thinking about is this actually a disease of the way that nerves talk to muscles? Is it maybe instead a nerve disease or a muscle disease? Or is it a less common subtype, uh, musk antibody or Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome? That's good advice. Know your markers. Mm -hmm. I like that. So LEMS and myasthenia gravis are both autoimmune disorders. Can you explain what that means for, for both, specifically for both disorders? Sure. So it means that the body's defense system is injuring a part of itself. So we know the defense system is really quite good at keeping you healthy. Uh, and for most people, the defense system behaves. Uh, so you get a runny nose, it doesn't become a sinus infection. You get a cough, it doesn't become a pneumonia. 
Um, so most of the time the defense system behaves, it recognizes problems, and it manages them. Sometimes the defense system starts to target things it shouldn't, and it could be tricked into doing that. Um, for example, if it was trying to fight off a cancer, or it might just happen spontaneously. But when the defense system starts to attack you rather than attacking a bacteria or a virus, that is a autoimmune disease. That makes sense. And, and for those individuals and patients that do have LEMS and MG, is it common that they would you know, have other autoimmune, autoimmune diseases? Uh, so it really depends on why you have Lambert-Eaton and or you have myasthenia gravis. We know that if you have one autoimmune illness, you are more likely to have another. That's just a general principle of patients who have inflammation in the body, uh, is that that inflammation can target other structures. We know that if you happen to have myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome because you have a tumor, that those syndromes tend to be the paraneoplastic pattern, that, that specific pattern. Um, whereas if you have had it arise spontaneously for no apparent reason, those patients may have other diseases that tend to arise spontaneously. That makes sense. And, and you, you just touched upon paraneoplastic. Can you explain what that is, um, sure. you know, in respect to LEMS patients? Sure. So, so para means around, neo means cancer, uh, and plastic is a part of that same cancer. So around a cancer diagnosis, then other problems arise. Um, and so the idea here is the body tries to defend against many threats, and one threat is cancers. When the body tries to defend against a cancer, it uses the defense system, the immune system. As you can imagine, the body isn't very good at damaging uh, itself. It's not supposed to be good at that. And so when it is forced into a situation where it has to, oftentimes that attack is not clean. And so inflammation ends up arising not just in the target, which is a cancer, but often in other places too. And, and so that's in regards to LEMS patients. What about MG patients in, in the, the possibility of cancers in MG patients? The younger you are, the more likely we wonder about thymomas in myasthenia gravis. With Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, it is small cell lung cancers. Um, and so slightly different cancers. Uh, the screening test in both cases is the same. It's a CAT scan of the chest. Okay, that, that makes sense. And when it comes to screening, now we're talking about screening, and you know, we know that LEMS patients, when they're diagnosed, they want to keep up with their screening. How often do you recommend that they keep, that they do that screening? Um, and if they go several years and they, they haven't developed, you know, cancer or small cell lung cancer, should they keep going and keep being tested and how often? There are not clear cut guidelines as to how to manage these sorts of situations. Um, but in general, if you have the initial diagnosis of either Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome or myasthenia gravis, it's reasonable to screen at that time. With Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, many patients end up going to the step of going to see a formal cancer doctor, an oncologist, uh, because the, the cancer in this question, a small cell lung cancer, can be quite aggressive. Our patients with myasthenia gravis, the thymomas tend to not to be very aggressive diseases. And so we end up often in neurology doing the, the CAT scan. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And so, so far in the discussion, we've talked about autoimmune. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about mycena gravis and LEMS, and then we've talked about, you know, a cancer diagnosis. Um, and often you're seeing different physicians for, you know, these different disorders. How do you recommend 
um, managing, you know, as a patient and managing all of these, you know, physicians and, and getting them up to speed um, with the, you know, your, the progress that you're making in, in your diagnosis and your treatment. Uh, so the most effective way to make sure that your various providers are communicating with each other is really to house your care under a single umbrella if it's possible. Uh, but these are big and weighty issues, uh, and in sometimes you might want to just see the best doctor, uh, the one who's the most experienced, regardless of whether or not they're in the same organization. Or maybe you live in a place where one organization doesn't have all of these hats, a neurology or a cancer doctor or what have you. And in that case, the ability of these providers to communicate with each other is so important that I would really advise our patients to take it into their own hands, to get copies of your office notes and hand deliver them at your appointments. When I review another physician's notes, it takes me maybe 60 seconds to read that note. Uh, but it might be really impactful and it's a very good use of office visit time. That's that's very good advice. And I, I guess in a nutshell, it's, um, you know, patients advocating for themselves and making sure they take you know control of their health care. Right, right. You know, they're especially when you're talking about specialists trying to co-manage a rare disease. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that communication is clear and as robust as possible. That's great advice. Thank you. So in moving on, um, and there's a lot of terminologies that, that we talk about um, with both MG and with LEMS, antibody. We hear antibody, you know, quite often. Can you explain what, you know, what is an antibody? An antibody is a flag uh, or a marker. Uh, so the analogy I like to use here is your mailbox. Your mailbox has a flag and that flag means something to your postal officer. Uh, the oftentimes if you've got it up, it means that you want that postal officer to pick something up. And so the, the body needs a way to mark things and that's what antibodies are. Your body, if it's exposed to a virus, let's call it chickenpox, uh, it will have seen that virus. It will know what's on the outside of that virus. It will develop a way to mark the virus so that the immune system can go in and clear it out. And it will remember how to do that. So you shouldn't get the chickenpox again. Uh, even though you get exposed, there's no doubt you get exposed over and over again. And so antibodies are flags. Oftentimes, once your body creates one of these markers, it circulates for the rest of your life, or if it diminishes, it takes a long time. That, that's a great explanation for that. Thank you. So more terminology here. Let's go through a couple more, um, I guess, words that we hear quite often with LEMS and both MG. Can you explain what a voltage-gated calcium channel blocker is? Yeah. So, so first off, what is a voltage gated channel? Uh, everybody, I think, is familiar with the concept of electrolytes. What is an electrolyte? It's things like potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium. These are the things in Gatorade. Um, so if you're exercising, you're sweating a lot, and you start to cramp, uh, you need to go drink some Gatorade, right? And maybe stretch. And the idea is that these electrolytes are important because the body uses these electrolytes to make things happen. So oftentimes, if the body wants a tissue to do something, it wants a nerve to send a signal, what will happen is that on the outside of the nerve, these channels will open uh, and in this case, so these are sodium channels, will open and a signal will be created. Uh, in the case of Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, it's calcium channels. And when the body wants to release a transmitter, acetylcholine, it will open those channels and allow uh, this uh, electrolyte to flow in. The 
electrolytes help trigger events in the body. And when you block the channels, you essentially block the ability to trigger an event. That makes sense. Thank you. So now let's flip it to MG. And can you uh, tell us what acetylcholine is? And if I'm even pronouncing it correctly. You are certainly <laughs> pronouncing it correctly. So the, what we're talking about right now is nerves talking to muscles. With Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, a signal will come down to nerve, the nerve will release acetylcholine. With myasthenia gravis, that acetylcholine will go over to the muscle and will cause the muscle to twitch. So what is acetylcholine? Acetylcholine is a messenger. It's a way of communicating a chemical that is released with the intention of making something happen, a transmitter. So nerves use many kinds of transmitters. Uh, this happens to be the major transmitter when nerves talk to muscles. Uh, transmitters are a way to translate the language of the nerves, which is little electrical impulses, with the language of the muscles, which is twitches. And so the nerve releases the acetylcholine and the in Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, that is the part that doesn't work right. And then the acetylcholine floats over to the muscle and triggers the muscle to do something. In myasthenia gravis, that's the part that doesn't work right. Interesting. Okay, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Uh, so let's start with symptoms. So the onset of symptoms are similar, from what I understand, of MG and, and LEMS, but are also different in, in, in how they present themselves. So uh, let's talk about, you know, the onset of symptoms for MG. What are the most typical ones? You know, in both cases, you tend to see neck up disease, um, perhaps with uh, myasthenia gravis, you see more in the eyes. And with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, you see more in the oropharynx, mouth and tongue. Uh, but those distinctions probably are not clear enough to call the difference between the two diseases just by looking at someone. Both of these diseases will involve some involvement of weakness in the shoulders and weakness in the hips. With Lambert-Eaton, there tends to be a little bit less of the breathing problems, with myasthenia gravis a little bit more. Uh, and so the profile of symptoms tends to be pretty similar in terms of what is affected. The major distinction between the two is when it, you have the effect. Okay. Pa patients with Lambert-Eaton tend to warm up. They with a lot of trouble because the nerve is just not getting signal out. Whereas patients with myasthenia tend to wear out. The nerve is crossing over to the muscle, but the muscle is not getting the signal uh, and, and translating it well. And so mornings tend to be more of a challenge for our Lambert-Eaton cases and mm -hmm. evenings for our myasthenics. Interesting. So it's so what you're saying, it's almost the opposite, meaning with MG, you can get up and get going, get moving, but is it your muscles fatiguing? Is that is that what's happening throughout the day? Yeah, so it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, and by no means do Lambert-Eaton patients become normal just with some effort. And and likewise, if, a, if myasthenia gravis patients just took it easy, they wouldn't be fine. Um, so, it, it, but it, there is a difference for many patients between the two groups as to what their morning experience is versus what their evening experience is and what's the harder time of day for them. So with the symptoms that um, you described right there, is it difficult to, die, to distinguish between the two? I think you, you basically said it, that it's really hard and maybe that's why an MG diagnosis is more common with physicians when they, they're presented with these symptoms. So to be clear, the patients who have traditional myasthenia gravis, the 
acetylcholine receptor blood marker on the muscle side are the bulk of the patients. Um, so they, they represent 80 or 85% of the patients. And then you have the less common subtypes. The major indicator to you that perhaps you are dealing with a patient who has an uncommon subtype is that maybe they don't have the traditional blood marker or if there's some problem getting the blood markers, perhaps that patient is just not responding to traditional treatments and type antibody. Over on the traditional myasthenia gravis side, uh, you would have the acetylcholine receptor antibodies, but also your striated muscle, agrin, uh, your uh, musk antibodies. So the blood work really does help quite a bit. There are other tests you can do, uh, in particular the EMG, the electromyogram, um, which many myasthenics know and love, where we shock them repeatedly <laughs> to try to tease out. You know, it doesn't what, sound like fun. <laughs> uh, you know, the vast majority of patients do pretty well. I personally perform about 700 EMGs a year, uh, and it's only a handful, maybe, maybe five or seven who really cannot tolerate it. We, we are really cognizant that nobody likes to get shocked with electricity and nobody likes to get poked with needles. And so we really try very hard to make sure that if we're going to do this and in, in particular do it re repetitively, that we're gonna do so as gently as we can. So are these tests done um, you know, be, do you do one before the other? Do you do them at the same time? Or do you recommend, you know, do you recommend only one or, or both? I know that was a lot in there, but, yeah. um, you know, what are your recommendations when a patient is going in to get these tests? Especially in a pandemic where we are talking about diseases of inflammation and these diseases are treated by using drugs that reduce your body's defense system. So in a pandemic, we're talking about reducing your body's defense system. You want to make sure that you're dealing with the right disease, that you've got the diagnosis down precisely. In neurology, there are a number of reasons why people could become weak or fatigued. Um, problems of the nerves, and some of the patients who are reading this will have at some point been diagnosed with ALS or may have been diagnosed with CIDP. Problems of the junction between nerve and muscle, that's Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome or acetylcholine myasthenia, or problems of the muscle. And again, some of the patients who are joining us will have been diagnosed with polymyositis. Uh, if you're confronting one of these diseases, they might look similar. You're going to want blood work and often you're going to want that EMG to try to tell between the, these diseases. Right, that makes sense, which goes back to know your antibody, right? <laughs> right. Uh, it is meaningful if you know your antibody because the once you do get an antibody that comes back, that's really pretty specific for your disease. Mm -hmm. It helps mm -hmm. explain a lot. It's also important for your provider to have a handle on what would be a good symptom that this antibody would explain. Um, unfortunately, with rare diseases, we often see a whole myriad of symptoms that are blamed on the rare disease when um, in fact uh, there's little reason why you couldn't also develop common stuff. Right, absolutely. And I can see with some of these symptoms or quite a few of them that you could blame it on fatigue, right. aging, you know, right. other things that are going on, um, other ailments that it would be difficult to pinpoint exactly what is going on. And and, you know, maybe that contributes to sometimes, you know, taking quite a while for these diagnoses to, you know, to come through. Yeah, you know, a, a very um, 
salient example. Um, you know, we had a young patient, um, myasthenia gravis. Because they're young, they also may have behaved in ways where they got Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis. The hallmark feature of mono is fatigue, mm -hmm. right? And so trying to tease out that circumstance between a, pa a patient who, if they didn't have myasthenia gravis, would have been easily diagnosed with mono. But now they have myasthenia gravis and you have a concern that it might be getting worse. You're going to more aggressively suppress their immune system, but they have an active infection, right? And you, you need uh -huh. to, right? Because um, getting more aggressive with the myasthenia is absolutely not the right answer there. Right. And so um, having a healthy suspicion that if things are not going right, that maybe your subtype of disease isn't right, or if things are not going right, maybe there is another alternative explanation. Mm -hmm. And this is really where the treatment team is so important. Right. Um, you know, having a internal medicine or a family practice doctor who's curious by nature. Right, uh, well, yes, absolutely. And finding that uh, practitioner that, that's right for you. Mm -hmm. um, do you recommend journaling, taking notes on a daily basis, you know, of what's going on that day? Or maybe you, you know, we're doing something, you know, you had a lot going on that day as opposed to the next day. I mean, what are your recommend recommendations on that as somebody's going through their journey? Yeah, so, you know, it can be hard to, to focus sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we are adjusting the medicines that we use for any variety of myasthenia gravis, it's oftentimes the reason, or the reason that we're doing it is because we're trying to focus on bad days. And so trying to understand what is the hallmark of a bad day, for example. Um, I have certain husbands whose um, priorities in their marriage is to get the dishes done because if they don't get the dishes done, nobody's going to be happy. Uh, a good husband. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's how they measure their disease. Uh, were they so tired that at the evening time, they, they just couldn't do that for their family. And, uh, and that was meaningful because that was a burden on their spouse. Right. And so it, it can be very hard, especially when so many muscles can be affected, vision, speech, upper and lower extremities, breathing. But to pick a goal and a goal that is meaningful in your life, um, for so many patients, it's, it's vision and driving, right? right. Pick a goal and uh, when we talk up to myasthenia patients, those patients so often report they're doing fine but they're not doing fine. There's something meaningful in their lives that is being interfered with. And I would hold that um, hold that goal in place. Right. That's very good advice. And do you feel like patients sometimes when they kind of lower their, their high watermark um, and their expectations, I guess that's what you're saying. They're, you kind of lower your expectations when you're going through something like this. Like, I guess this this is where I should be, but like you said, hold it a little higher, higher, and you know, try to try to reach that goal. This is a disease in 2020 that should be manageable, and so I would not want a patient to accept anything less than well managed. Right. And what do you recommend for both MG and for for LEMS on on managing um, their disorder? Right. So. Myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome are diseases of inflammation. The major treatments that help to control these diseases then have to manage inflammation. And so many patients with these diseases will be on immune modulators. Those are drugs that affect your ability to produce an immune uh, response. Uh, and that those drugs will, in general, decrease the uh, vigor or strength of the disease. 
but they will also put you at risk for infections because they'll prevent you from defending yourself. There are also treatments for these diseases that help with the day-to-day -day fluctuations. And these treatments help with the efficiency of how well the nerve releases signals and how well the muscles pick it up. That makes sense. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and it's, it's nice to know that there are options out there for patients, yeah. um, especially during this time. Wonderful. So Dr. Sashev, thank you so much for joining us here today. Are there any final remarks that you have um, before we, we say goodbye? Uh, I just, I really want to emphasize to the patients out there, uh, this can be a scary disease. Uh, almost every patient who has had the disease, either Lambert-Eaton or myasthenic syndrome or, or, my, or myasthenia gravis, they remember a time when they couldn't see, couldn't talk, couldn't breathe, couldn't climb stairs, and a time when they really wondered if they were ever going to or if this was their new normal. Uh, and that is a really dramatic uh, and challenging thing to deal with. And so I would encourage patients to talk about that, uh, to talk with other people, to talk with their families. I would also encourage patients to be reassured, despite the word gravis in the name of the disease, it remains a really serious group of diseases. But we really have, I think, a reasonable handle on how to manage these conditions. And so you want to find a provider that you trust, a provider that's local to you, uh, and a provider who I think has a handle on what could be the disease versus what could be something else more common. Uh, and once you find that provider, that's a beautiful thing. And rest assured that you don't have to live with the really significant burden from this illness. You don't have to have shortened life expectancy. You should still save for retirement <laughs> um, because I think we can manage these diseases. That is fantastic advice, especially the retirement part. Right. <laughs> I'm kidding, no, but no, that's wonderful. That's great advice that, you know, there is a good future ahead for both LEMS patients and, and MG patients and, and to, keep on keeping on, right? Right, right. And you know, I, I, I am privileged to work with so many myasthenia patients and I'm privileged to help um, direct a number of trials here at, at Michigan State. Uh, we have some exciting treatments coming. Wonderful, wonderful. That's great news. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Satchdev. And before we go, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. And MGMI is excited to see you all tomorrow for their MG Real Talk on crisis from the patient perspective. And that will launch at noon Eastern time. And we hope you all will join. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a fantastic day. Take care, Amy. Take care. <laughs>